I come to you from 5,000 miles away, Liberia. I don't come directly from Liberia because I divide my time between there and here in the U.S. But directly, I come to you from two and a half hours away from Maryland, and I come to bring a really short message. Had I known that I would have been preceded by my two distinguished academic colleagues, I would have just said my apologies and stayed where I was. <laughs> because as each of them was speaking, I was just checking off items that were on my list that I to share. Um, but as I'm already here, I must as well, might as well just go forward and do the best I can. But the message I came to bring is this. Africa is shaped like a question mark but Africa has the answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when I say this, what I'm suggesting is, in your mind's eye, think about the map of Africa. <clears throat> and you know, it kind of curves around and goes down like that. Uh, all that's missing is that little point at the bottom, but we can put that aside. For all intents and purposes, it's shaped like a question mark. So why do I say it has the answers? Well, it's been throwing up answers for a mighty long time. When I was a child, a mighty long time ago, um, it was widely assumed, and we were taught, that humanity began in the Middle East. I think some of you are old enough to remember that. But in my lifetime, science has not only debunked that idea, but has established rather firmly that it is Africa that provides the answer to that question. So we come to another point, and this is one that is very difficult for some of us to receive. And it's the question of this thing we call civilization. For centuries we've been told that all of the characteristics of civilization developed everywhere else but. And these characteristics include oh, stable governance, settled societies, agriculture, right? the arts, culture. But yet, ancient Egypt, which exists on the continent of Africa, and uh, ancient Aksum, and, you know, the early uh, uh, progenies of, uh, 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 progenitors of uh, Ethiopia, uh, all had those characteristics. And Egypt existed not for a century or five, but for 5,000 years. And although it exists on the continent, you know, there are controversies, if you will, brought on by those who argue that, well, it may be on that landmass, but it's actually it owes its origin to people from elsewhere. So let's put aside Egyptian civilization, and I say to you that um, there's, there's another civilization that we tend to overlook. I don't want to come forward to the more recent one. I want to go back. And that takes us to what is now the Sahara Desert. Again, science has come to show that uh, the Sahara thousands of years ago was absolutely different from what it is now. There were four rivers, there was a lake, and we found the fossils of whales, but more importantly, we found the evidence, indisputable evidence of civilization. People lived there, 
in settled communities, herding domesticated animals, engaged in agriculture, living stable lives, creating art, some of which remain on the rocks on which they were painted, burying their dead, and placing on the graves flowers, some of which have survived, the remnants have survived, and in some cases, jewelry. This tells us, it suggests that those doing this had ideas about an afterlife. So when we think about the beginnings of civilization, Africa looks like a question mark, but Africa has the answer. We think of monotheism, another one of those features of contemporary humanity <clears throat> that it was assumed developed in other places, but never, ever, ever among Africans. But the truth is, there was monotheism in ancient Egypt that in most African cultures today, the traditional spiritual systems were monotheistic. People believed in one creator, but I don't want to go down that path and take you into areas you may not have been exposed to and you might be heavily skeptical about. So let me share with you some elements of monotheism that I think all of us are more familiar with. And uh, one of those would be Christianity. In many respects, Africa was a cradle. And I say this based on the Christian scripture. When Herod was pursuing this child who had been visited by the Magi, where did his parents take him? To hide until his maturity. And after the crucifixion and the apostles were sent out, St. Mark went to North Africa. And before Rome converted, he, without an army, had converted Egyptians, Nubians, and Ethiopians. And the rock churches of Ethiopia carved into solid rock formations are a testament to the early development of Christianity. It's almost as if the ancestors of the Ethiopians didn't want anyone to come later on and deny that uh, they had given the world, uh, the, the, the given early Christianity the refuge that it needed. Uh, and for Christianity as it, as it came to be manifested in, in Europe, first in Rome, and then later in uh, Protestant forms of Christianity, St. Augustine was considered a critical thinker. His ideas are still woven into European Christianity. But most don't acknowledge or like to realize he was a North African. So when it comes to monotheism, Africa had the answer. Rather than go through the various ages, which would take us long, and we've been here long enough, I will skip ahead and look more towards where we are now in the future. And what I want to say to you is as my colleague said earlier, many of the resources needed for the development of humanity's economic future can be found in the continent. Uh, not just the ones that we've relied on 
for so long, those that are integral to industrialization as we know it, but the ones that are associated with, that are absolutely important for what looks like the next phase of our development. And I'm thinking about the ingredients for electric batteries for electric vehicles. I'm thinking, as my colleague said, of cell phones. Okay? So all of these ingredients are found in Africa. And although Africa itself is not developed, when it comes to the future development of the world, Africa has the answer. What I would like to add, though, before I close, is that given the kind of relationship that has existed, has existed for so long between Africa and many other parts of the world, addressed earlier by my two colleagues, because of that relationship, traditionally, it's been assumed that if Africa didn't contribute, had a lesser role to play, it would be integrated into the world economy and the world institutions in a more subservient role. But that relationship is changing. It has already changed in some places, and it continues to change. And so when we think about the world's population, <coughs> Africa has the answer. Sure, Asia is far ahead. In many respects, you take China, you take India, which is surpassing China now, but the African population is growing rapidly. And one thing Africa doesn't have a shortage of is land. The density, <laughs> population density is relatively low compared to many other places. And not only that, the population is youthful. So for manufacturers interested in consumers, Africa has the answer. But it's not likely to be the same old, same old answers of 10, 20, 40 years ago. Africa is no longer that place where ex excess goods can be sent to be disposed of. <laughs> And so I want to give you two examples from two ends of society. Some of you may have heard of the Land Cruiser. It's a product of the Toyota Motor Company. And I say some of you because it's actually quite rare to see a, a Land Cruiser in the US. It wasn't made for this market. The Japanese developed it for markets like Africa. One could say developed it for the African market in particular. It is rugged, but if you're willing to pay top dollar, it could also be equipped with luxury items. When I was in Liberia, I drove a Land Cruiser that had two gas tanks in it. Why? Because in Africa, gas stations are few and far between, and you don't want to be left out on the highway right, without fuel. And so it's built for that market. And the result is NGOs from elsewhere, uh, aid organizations, uh, expatriates, uh, those who can afford this expensive vehicle, uh, those with high levels of uh, income, uh, disposable income, drive land cruisers. So here's the other example, and it comes from the other end of the market. Developed by people in, in another society. Telephone. Traditionally, 
the idea is you take homes that were developed for the American market or you know the European market, and you what you can't sell here, you dump in Africa. It doesn't work like that anymore. You see, when I was there, the Chinese had developed. Uh, and there's an entire company that had emerged in China that developed a, a, a brand, a set, set of phones, but the brand is Techno. And uh, the phone hits the right price point. It doesn't aim to be an iPhone in all that it can do. But even the camera is, was developed specifically to match the general skin tone of Africans. Because many of us may not realize this, but you know, many of the phones that were developed were developed for people who uh, were of European backgrounds and who lived in the environments where the phones were manufactured. The Chinese are making phones specifically for that market. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, this continent is available for these interactions, for these partnerships. The terms of the partnerships are changing, um, and that requires some re-examination of how we engage with this continent. But that continent, which is shaped like a question mark, is the continent with the answers.